Ah, yeah. Thank you very much for the kind invitation to come here in this fantastic room. Uh, I have to apologize that I talk about quantum physics, but I was invited. I have to apologize because Paris is such a great place for quantum physics, and I am bringing coals to Newcastle, or owls to Athens, in a sense. Anyway, uh, what you see here on the first picture is uh, the telescope, the telescope which we are using in our experiments on the Canary Islands to test quantum communication over large distances. I will say a little bit about more, uh, more about that. To go right to Einstein, as you all know, in uh, 1905 was Einstein's Annus Mirabilis, where he wrote in my eyes at least four papers where each of them would deserve the Nobel Prize. He got the Nobel Prize for this one, uh, where he proposed the particle nature of light. It's actually interesting to read the paper itself. It is often presented as the uh, uh, photoelectron uh, paper. The photoelectron story is only the last two pages. The paper itself is much more interesting than that. And uh, Einstein uh, calls, uh, is a, is a, as far as is known, and I asked historians, Einstein called this uh, paper very revolutionary. And it's, as far as is known, it is the only paper of himself which, which he ever called revolutionary to, in a letter to his friend Habicht in the same year. And there's a famous quote by Einstein, I, I want to spend the rest of my life thinking about the question uh, what light is. Uh, the next step, just again carrying coast to Newcastle, uh, is the notion of entanglement, which we have to uh, talk briefly about. It goes back to this, uh, to this seminal. It's not focused. By a paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen from uh, 1935. Uh, where they introduce the simple fact that if you have a system uh, consisting of two partial systems uh, which have interacted at some time in the past, then measurement on one instantly, instantly changes the other one uh, independent of space and time. does not matter how f uh, uh, far they are separated and so on. And Einstein uh, didn't like that. Here's the original quote in the letter to Max Born of 3rd of December 1947. Uh, he says, uh, I cannot uh, seriously believe in it, namely quantum theory, because the theory cannot be reconciled with the principle, principle, Grundsatz, principle, that, uh, that physics has to describe a reality in space and time independent of spooky actions at the distance. He considered this spooky action at the distance. Here is a, uh, a picture which shows you the uh, development of our field. Our field, I mean all the friends, Alain uh, Espé and uh, Claude Cointanucci and others who are sitting here, uh, of our field, specifically the field uh, on einstein bodowski rosen correlations, is the citations of that paper according to the Science Citation Index. You see something interesting here. The paper was published in 1935. There were very few citations. You can actually look them up because Einstein has a page on Google Scholar now. Somebody, somebody organized that. You can also find his age index and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, so, it's, so it's interesting. Anyway, so the paper came out in 1935, and there were very few citations. There were not bad citations. Two of them were by Schrödinger, one was by Niels Bohr. And then nothing. Uh, because the uh, work on foundations of quantum mechanics was considered not to be quite the right thing to do. It picks up in the 1960s, essentially because of John Bell, when he discovered his theorem, and the quotations explode around 2000, uh, when it was found that the entanglement is at the uh, root of new protocols in quantum communication, quantum uh, uh, computation, and so on. Today, as you can see, the paper is cited on the average about once a day. But I submit that it is not necessarily read more often these days. You know how this goes. So here's uh, uh, Erwin Schrödinger. Erwin Schrödinger in 1935 
uh, same year, shortly after the einstein podolsky rosen paper, uh, published about the situation. And it's interesting that he was able to do this so early. It turns out that uh, Schrodinger had uh, been thinking about the situation already since about 1930. So uh, it was, so to speak, in the air. And uh, Schrodinger writes uh, that this is, to him, it is the essential feature of quantum mechanics. And he says the interesting point is that if you have entangled systems, uh, then you have uh, the situation where only, as he writes, joint expectation catalogs uh, for, the, for the both systems exceed, uh, exist. The joint expectation catalogs are the quantum state. So you have only a joint quantum state, but you have no expectation catalog for the individual particles. The individual results are completely random. And this is a very, very, very modern view. You can replace expectation catalogs by information, and then you have a, a, a today's view. It's quite amazing how, how far Schrodinger was, was thinking. Here is in a nutshell Bell theorem, and then I, I end my, my view back into the, my introductory part. Uh, John Bell in 1964 uh, discovered that the few point of uh, the einstein podolsky rosen paper, which is local realism, is the combination of locality, namely no action at a distance, and realism, namely the idea that physics has to describe a reality in space and time uh, independent of measurement that the combination of these two leads to limitations of correlations on measurements on two systems uh, under, cer under certain conditions. Namely, uh, what you see here is the quintessential case of a modern experiment where uh, photons are entangled in polarization. You have a source. This can be a nonlinear optical crystal but pr pumped by, a, by, a, uh, by, by some, some laser pump, and you create pairs of photons and you find that the two photons are either both horizontally polarized or both vertically polarized, this being a superposition, which means that it is not a statistical mixture. It is wrong to think that half of the photons are horizontally polarized. In half of the cases, both photons are horizontal. In half of the cases, both photons are vertically polarized. No, uh, uh, this only describes the possible measurement results, which you will get if you measure. Now, Bell's theorem simply says, if you consider now other measurements, like horizontal, this is vertical horizontal, vertical horizontal. If you consider now correlations between, on one side, a well-defined uh, base basis, on the other one, a basis only slightly rotated, very slightly rotated. Then uh, quantum mechanics describes that the, that the correlation should go with the cosine, whereas a local realist paper should, uh, describes that the correlation should go linearly with the, with the deviation. That's the essence. So, or in another word, quant for small uh, angles, the quantum correlations are much stronger than any classical correlation. And that's the essence of Bell's inequality, which is simply the sum of four correlation parameters. Uh, uh, it is limited, uh, 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 they are limited, and quantum mechanics can violate, violate that. What to me is, is more interesting is actually Einstein's uh, argument in, in the uh, uh, book by Schilp. Uh, Schilp wrote a, or edited a book, uh, Einst Albert Einstein, Philosopher Scientist, uh, which contains many interesting articles. For example, one by Gödel, where he introduces his, his closed uh, time-like loops. Uh, another one by Menger, where he talks about lump geometry, and so on and so on. A beautiful collection. There's also a paper by the boy, for example. And uh, Einstein, uh, Einstein says that what worries him is that, uh, that I can choose here on the other side which basis I want to measure in. And then just by that choice of the basis, I define, uh, uh, I define in which basis the uh, photon on the other side is well defined uh, once I, we, I, I do the measurement here. Okay, so if I define this basis, it's horizontal, vertical that way. If I rotate some angle, it's horizontal or vertical that way. And he says, therefore, since he says that, what, that, the, that, the, that the properties of the system must be independent of my choice here, uh, uh, the wave function cannot describe the real factual situation on the other side. Now, today we know 
that quantum mechanics speaks a different language. Uh, here's uh, just as a reference to the genius, genius Lozi here. I understand one of the very first uh, meetings on the topic was organized here at the Fondation Hugo uh, in 1980. And there, John Bell made this beautiful drawing of Bertelmann's, so uh, Bertelmann's socks. Bertelmann is a colleague of mine at the University of Vienna who still is alive. He's a good friend of mine. And he always wears socks of different color. So when you see him coming around the corner, you know, uh, and you see, one, you see a pink sock, then you definitely know that the other sock is not pink. This is not surprising at all, because you know Bertelmann. Uh, and then the whole article goes in a very nice way at length. Uh, if this, why, if these were quantum socks, the assumption that these socks had the colors before observation would be wrong. Now here is a picture of the, of the kind of quintessential situation, how the experiments are done now. They are very simple now. There was an enormous uh, progress. That's an experiment we did at Documenta. Documenta, as you know, is one of the big exhibitions of contem 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 con uh, contemporary art. Every five years in Kassel, we were there in 2012, we were asked to show our experiments. So this kind of was promoted to a piece of art. So you have a, a pump, which pumps a nonlinear crystal, and you create, create pairs of photons, which are entangled afterwards, maybe in such kind of a state. Uh, this is the real pump beam. These are just mock-ups to say where the, where the beam is. Uh, uh, now to come to more modern, modern work, modern uh, 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 experiments leading to entanglement. Uh, a standard situation for us is, is long distance entanglement because we want to uh, demonstrate proof that uh, this kind of correlation can be used in the worldwide uh, uh, communication network in the end. I should say that I personally believe, this is just a belief, I cannot prove it, I personally believe that someday uh, 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 our, uh, all our uh, information processing and communication will be built on such quantum phenomena. Because there is no principle, fundamental reason why it should not be. But this is just a belief. I cannot prove it, certainly. Now, here's this uh, La Palma situation, uh, uh, distance 150 kilometers, uh, the nonlinear crystal which we pump. One of the two photons is sent over to the Canary Islands, uh, uh, over to Tenerife and measured there. The, uh, the, the, the second photon is kept locally and measured on La Palma at some later time, which can be varied. And you get the correlations according to Bell's inequality, Violet Bell's inequality. You can establish quantum cryptography and so on. I should mention that there is a parallel development uh, using uh, demonstrating long distance communication in glass fibers, and that was pioneer, uh, pioneered by the group of, uh, of Nicolas Chizan on the lake of uh, Geneva. There are beautiful experiments where they use glass fibers uh, uh, displayed there. Here's a picture of the situation between La Palma and Tenerife. Uh, uh, I should mention, for those of you who don't know that, uh, uh, we are not there for the reason some of you might think. It's not the wine, it's not the beach, it's not the food. It is because on La Palma and Tenerife, there are clusters of telescopes on each island, about a dozen of telescopes. Uh, they are together sometimes called the European Northern Observatory. So you have all the infrastructure you need for such experiments. This is the receiving station. You saw that already, the inside of the receiving station. Uh, the sending situation, here we have a small uh, the, uh, a small telescope with such a diameter, uh, sending the photons over to the other side. That is just a guide beam to adjust the two telescopes onto each other. This is a romantic picture for the romantic natures among you. Uh, you have to imagine you are standing on El Teides, the largest mountain of Spain, 3,800 meters. It is just around sunset, so the sun is behind you. That's a side crater. Sun is behind you, full moon. And what you see here is the shadow of the volcano on which you stand. And for the experiment, the point is, this is bad news. Uh, the shadow is on, the, on, on sand, fine sand from the Sahara Desert. 
which is the biggest problem, biggest challenge in our experiment. Okay. So now we come to quantum teleportation. The idea of quantum teleportation goes back to, to uh, Bennett, Brassard, Crepeau, Joseph, Perez, and Wouters in 1993. And when they came out with the idea, our immediate reaction was that this is an impossible experiment. It was impossible at that time. Uh, we did not know that we uh, 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 kind of developed the tools for that, not knowing that we did it for some other reason. The basic idea is to transfer the quantum state of an unknown system over to another photon. Uh, by doing the following, you have an auxiliary entangled pair. You entangle uh, one from the entangled pair with the one you want to teleport, and uh, you uh, teleport the quantum state basically instantly, but it can be rotated in, in, can be, uh, rotated in an, uh, a way which is random depending on the entangling procedure here. More about that in a second. The question then is how to entangle uh, two independent systems. And this is something where no ideas were around in 1993. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the basic motor for us, uh, historically speaking, was the following one. In uh, uh, a little earlier, we had found to, together with Greenberger and Horn, that if you have entanglement between, between three systems, not just two, then the contradiction of, between quantum mechanics and local realism is not statistical anymore, but is a, it is a contradiction on every individual uh, measurement. Okay? And this was my goal all the time. These are now called GHZ states. This was my goal all the time to realize this. From 1988 on. And it took us 10 years. This is interesting. And doing this, we developed the tools for teleportation. So teleportation is a spin-off of this kind of stuff. So the, the, the basic idea, uh, I, uh, at least for us, the basic idea was the following one. That's the idea just uh, published with uh, Hohen, Weinfurter, and Marek Schukowski. The basic idea is that you pump a nonlinear crystal in such a way that you have a high enough probability that you uh, get two photons within the coherence time. And then you, measure one of the, then you measure one photon here, and you measure it in such a way that there is no way to tell to which of two pairs the photon belongs. So you have two entangled pairs, which are in a product state. You project this onto a state uh, uh, where the information from which of the two pairs the photon comes uh, uh, is, is, is erased. And then the other three are entangled if, under the condition that you get one photon here, one photon here, one photon here. So it's the erasure of information from where a photon uh, comes. And uh, as, you, as you saw before, this is the essence necessary for quantum teleportation. So this is a, 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 just a development there was a three-photon GHZ state, four-photon state, and very recently there were beautiful experiments by the Qian Wei Pan group in China uh, showing entanglement for, uh, for eight photons, and the group of Burenane in Stockholm is trying to go uh, even further. Uh, these states are considered to be important for some quantum information protocols, but I do not want to go into this here. An interesting notion I just mentioned on the side about quantum computation is what is called blind quantum computation. It's an idea which came from broadband, Fitzsimons and Kashevi in 2009. The idea is a very simple one and it's a beautiful one. Uh, 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 no, the idea is not simple, the challenge is simple, sorry. The challenge is, is, is very simple, the idea is extremely elegant. Uh, the point is, uh, you suppose you have a future quantum internet and uh, you are the client who wants to do some operations on a quantum server, a quant essential quantum computer. Uh, as a customer, you want to make sure that the operator of the quantum computer has no idea whatsoever which kind of problem you are analyzing. He should not know whether you are analyzing the stock market or whether you are just playing chess or whatever. Okay? 
and the, 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 the solution, the one solution by broadband from Simon Kashevi is the following. Uh, uh, the client, as it says here, has limited quantum computational power, which is limited to be, uh, being able to just prepare arbitrary quantum bits. Arbitrary superpositions of zero and one, or in the language of photons, arbitrary superpositions of two polarizations. And he sends a string of such arbitrary states, each one defined in the states which only he knows, over to the quantum server. The quantum server then entangles these states with each other by procedures which I just mentioned, and that way obtains what is called a cluster state. And such a cluster state uh, uh, can be shown to be capable of, of uh, universal quantum computation. So then the, the essential quantum server runs the quantum computation, maybe in addition with input data from what you, what you provide, and uh, runs the quant uh, and, and sends and does prescribed measurements, measurements which you tell, tell the quantum server onto that, onto that uh, 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 cluster state, sends you the results, and only you as the customer can understand what the what the, uh, uh, what the result means. The uh, uh, operator has no way to uh, understand what the computation is you are doing because he would have to know the string of qubits coming, but qubits cannot be, as you know, individual quant uh, quantum states are protected against being determined in individual measurements by the no cloning theorem. Now here's finally the quantum teleportation protocol in full, uh, uh, in, in full formalism. So you have an incoming uh, uh, arbitrary uh, superposition state. You have uh, the two, this is the state number one here. You have in addition an entangled state between two and three. So you have this kind of product state, two and three are psi minus entangled. So that in that case, HV plus minus VH. And the point simply being that that uh, is, if you simply rewrite this as a superposition of entangled states between one and two, then you can see immediately that state three factors out and is in a superposition, but four different superpositions which contains the original information alpha and beta right away. So the, in a sense, the information is, arrives instantly as soon as this measurement is performed here, arrives instantly but it is encoded in a sense that it cannot be in only be decoded if you know what the results of the entangling measurement here was. Uh, the entangling is done by using uh, beam splitters and polarizers and so on and so on. Uh, here's a, uh, some recent results from, from uh, both the Chinese group, again, Chi and Weipan, and our group, in, in, in uh, on the Canary Islands, teleportation over 97 kilometers across the lake in China and 143 kilometers between the Canary Islands. A conceptually more, even more interesting procedure is, uh, is uh, uh, entanglement swapping, which is the teleportation of, an in, of a state which is entangled. So what you do is, you create, in that case, you create two entangled pairs, zero, one, and two, three, and you entangle these two, one and two. So this is the, uh, uh, this is the original state. This is the original state, one, two, and two, three are entangled. And that can be rewritten as a superposition of four pairs of entangled states between zero, three, and one, two. That means that if you do a Bell state measurement here, you entangle two photons which have never interacted with each other. This is conceptually interesting because it shows that entanglement is not uh, coming only from conservation laws at the source or from, from, uh, from uh, interaction between the qubits. It is basically, the basic point is to me, the message is what is important here is information. You have these two entangled states where in the old language of Schrodinger, the joint information is defined. These two states, again in the language uh, of Schrodinger, remember the expectation catalogs, the joint information is defined. And by doing this measurement, you erase the separate information, oops, you erase the separate information of these two photons, you erase it by projecting onto an entangled state here, 
and that way the outer two become entangled. It is considered that this kind of procedure is an important ingredient to future quantum repeaters in future long-distance quantum networks. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, original proposal is uh, Duan, Lukin, Sirak, Zoller, 2001. I should mention that the future is in space. We are collaborating with China, with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, uh, on a space satellite project. Uh, the idea is to have uh, 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 quantum sources on satellites. Uh, uh, in the end, the whole uh, smorgasbord, so weak laser pulses, individual photons, uh, not triggered from an entangled pair and even entangled photons. The project is in a, is in a uh, rather advanced stage. Uh, I understand that the launching of the satellite is planned for the first half of 2016. So it is rather soon. You know, it's, uh, satellite projects oft, often have a delay in the last minute, but this is the schedule. And we in, in Vienna, op, uh, Austria, op, uh, are responsible for operating ground stations, for receiving the individual photons. In Europe, we have four different ground stations. Now I want to come to something which I initially, when I announced, announced the title, didn't intend to talk, but it's now actual. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very current kind of uh, uh, thing going on. It's about loopholes in Bell experiments. If you look at the quantum, at the, uh, in the, these quantum experiments, uh, uh, if you look at the correlations, there are loopholes which a local realist could, could use to save his or her neck. Loopholes which make it possible to adapt a local realistic interpretation. Uh, the, four, the three major loopholes I've written down here. The first one is the communication loophole. It's a loophole which was first closed by a famous experiment by Aspe Dalibar, where Sean Dalibar is here, yeah, and, and so on, here in Orsay in 1982. Uh, the idea simply is that uh, you could have a situation where measurement, where, where if you have a static experiment, if you, you, you measure the correlations, uh, that uh, there is some unknown communication between both sides. It goes outside standard physics. This is quite clear. Some unknown communication between both sides in the following way, that one side tells the other one what is being measured. And you can easily show that if you assume that, then you can explain all quantum correlations. There is no problem. The way to close this is to trick nature or trick the photons by switching in the last instance the polarization you want to measure. So fast that no signal is possible from one side to the other because that such a signal is limited by the speed of light. As I said, the first experiment was in 1982. Uh, we did an exp uh, this was with periodic switching. Ours was with random number generators sometime later. Uh, the second loophole is the fair sampling loop loophole. Again, you have to assume that nature is very vicious. Nature is vicious in the following way, that nature gives you when you do, do, do not detect all particles, nature only allows you to measure a subset of particles which obeys quantum mechanics. But if you would measure all of them, we, they would violate quantum mechanics. It can easily be shown that uh, such a model is possible. I know it is very contrived. Such a model is possible uh, uh, unless you detect more than about two-thirds of all events. If you detect more than two-thirds, then this is not possible anymore. Uh, this, this was first closed by the Vineland Group uh, for atoms uh, around 2000. Then another uh, loophole is the freedom of choice loophole, which is much more difficult uh, to address. It's the, uh, it's the point that you have to assume that the choice of measurement uh, is, is independent or, ran or random. Now, there have been now th uh, f uh, three experiments which uh, aim at closing all loopholes at once. There was one by the Hansen Group in Delft, in Nature, it was published about uh, two months ago, where you, they look at the uh, uh, correlations between uh, spins in uh, diamond. There is an experiment uh, done by the NIST Group, where they look at correlations between photons, 15-50 nanometers, over a distance of 190 meters. And there is our experiment, all, uh, what just sub submitted on the archive, where we look at correlations over distances of about 60 meters. Uh, they, they, they were, here's a picture of our experiment. 
we went into a basement of the Hofburg Castle in Vienna because that is very quiet, very stable temperature, and so on and so on. Here's the Hofburg Castle, if you have you ever seen it. Uh, they, we, we have the two on the archive at the same time because we hit the submit button at the same second. Three, two, one, go. And it was well enough in the same time. So, uh, why is this interesting? Because, uh, or, uh, because it's interesting in its own right to have a loophole free Bell experiment. And secondly, I, uh, because uh, loophole, free, uh, loophole free Bell experiment is the final proof that uh, secure quantum communication is possible. I come slowly to the end of my talk. Uh, here is the uh, out view, uh, outlook to the future. Uh, the point is, I told you before about the freedom of choice. The question is, which choice of randomness is most independent from any other influences? And then you can, you, 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 you have to look for independent source of sources of randomness which are further and further away. The ultimate probably is to take the randomness from fluctuations of quasar light at different distances, at different directions in the, in the universe. Uh, that experiment is now is going on. We have a collaboration with the group at, at, uh, at MIT. And uh, part of the group is Alan Guth. Uh, you, you know, he's famous for his inflationary universe model. Because the point is that there are quasars. It actually, if you go far enough out, then most of the quasars have no overlapping uh, past light cone uh, after the inflation. So this is the most in independent source of randomness you can have. I should come to a close now. Uh, I don't know, is it time? I should close slowly, right? I don't know what to do. Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. I want, to, I want to kind of, because I want to show you a film in the, at, the, in the, at the end for your relaxation. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, uh, what, uh, the, the final bit is simply uh, a question is where to go further, particularly in communication. Right now we are limited with basically one bit per photon. Can we go much further? And the way to go further is to use what is called orbital angular momentum states of photons, where the wave front is a screw. And then you can have different uh, angular momenta relative to the it's an external angular momentum relative to the propagation axis. So a photon can carry any multiple of h bar angular momentum. There is no limit in principle. There are practical limits, but in principle there is no limit. And uh, these are pictures how these modes look like. I don't want to go into that. There have been experiments where we were able to show that angular momentum, momenta were entangled up to 10,000, quantum numbers of 10,000. 10,000 units of h bar. Why do we do this? Because in my opinion, there is no limit to quantum phenomena. It's not because of high quantum numbers. It's not, of, not because of the complexity of the quantum system or whatsoever. We have done other experiments where we could show that in that system, photons are entangled in at least 100 times 103 dimensions. So this is one fo photon in one state, 10,000. Here, a photon is in 100 time, uh, uh, dimensions, this photon, and this photon also in 100 dimensions. And they're all entangled with each other. Okay? So for the fun of it, we did an experiment over long-distance quantum communication uh, using these states. Uh, uh, the motivation is that there were various papers which said that this will not be possible to go beyond one kilo kilometer uh, because the states are by necess necessity extended and they would suffer from fluctuations. So what we found is, yes, this is all absolutely true, but if instead of looking at the states you look at superpositions of the states, then you have maximum and minima and counting the maximum and minima is stable much more stable against atmospheric fluctuations. So here's, oh, this is just a, uh, a, a proof that this can also be done with, with entanglement. It's not important. Here is Einstein in the end. All, all the 50 years of conscious brooding have brought me, this is a subjective statement, no closer to answer the question, what are light quanta? Of course, today, every rascal thinks he knows the answer, but he is deluding himself. And this is a very beautiful quote, 1913. Einstein was elected to the Prussian Academy of Sciences. This is the uh, nomination letter. 
signed by Planck and Ernst Rubens Warburg. Planck is clear, his role in quantum mechanics. So Rubens was the experimentalist who was leading the group for the black body radiation experiments. So they both knew what they were talking about. And they say here, the fact that he, in his speculations, uh, uh, occasionally went too far, shot beyond the goal. Uh, uh, for example, in his hypothesis of light quanta should not be held too strongly against him. Because without okay, occasionally daring something risky, not even in the most exact scientists you can introduce anything really new. It's amazing that this is 1913. And in 1922 he got the Nobel Prize for, for, for exactly that. And that is the nice thing about science, that opinions can change. <laughs> Here is a, a picture of my group, uh, a telescope in the roof of our building. Uh, we called it the Hedy Lamar Quantum Communication Telescope. I don't, I mean, some of you must know who Hedy Lamar was. She was a fa very famous actor. She came from Vienna. Uh, she had to leave Austria because of the Nazis. She lived in... in in, uh, uh, in, in the United States afterwards. And in 1942, she had a patent uh, about cryptography using frequency hopping, using unpredictable hopping of frequency. And that's the reason why we, we called the telescope after here. And here's the brief movie at the end. I hope I can start it now. This is, this is just for your relaxation. It's about the, the, long, the communication in Vienna with spatially modulated light. These are the different alphabets we can send with one photon, the different letters of the alphabet. These are different superpositions of OAM state. That is, for example, a 16-letter alphabet for one and the same photon, just the number of maximum and minima is different. So that's a, a problem with the atmosphere. <laughs> My students are nice, aren't they? Drawing such pictures. So here's the sending station, the receiving station. Uh, the way we create these is we send a beam onto a spatial light modulator where we introduce the different patterns and that introduces these maxima minima structures. We change the patterns in real time and we identify them on the other side, as you will see in a moment. Here's the receiving screen. Uh, in that experiment, we observed them uh, with a CCD camera and we had a, a directly uh, here are the receiving patterns. Uh, we directly count the maxima and minima. And we identify them using an a adaptive neural network. Now the information is a picture of... of of uh, Mozart's scanned bit by bit. So again, every pixel has a different pattern. And we scan across. It's a different pattern. What counts is the mani mi number of maximum and minima. And that is a feature which survives in the quantum, in the quantum uh, case uh, uh, too, which is quite important. So this is the end. I just want to see, show the names of the people who really did the work. Mario Krenn, Robert Fickler, Matthias Fink, Johannes Hansteiner, Mehul Malik, Thomas Ursin and Rupert, uh, Thomas Scheidel, Rupert Ursin. So thank you very much. Many thanks for this uh, nice, intriguing lecture, and uh, I would like now to open the discussion. So, who wants to start with a question? Alain Aspe is burning for that. Yes, Anton. 
all this is beautiful. And uh, the last experiments on the loophole free uh, Bell's inequality test, in fact, of course, we all know that uh, uh, more than closing something, it's opening uh, uh, a new field, the possibility of uh, quant of device independent uh, cryptography and things like that. Could you, could you uh, elaborate a little bit on this notion of device independent uh, security, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Because uh, I, I think that these the things that people should remember from this last experiment, that we are ready to use quantum mechanics for device independent security. Right. Right. Uh, Can you yes, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. <laughs> uh, it relates a little bit to, the, to this blind quantum computation, which is the next step. Uh, the point is, is if, suppose, suppose I want to use a quantum communication uh, link uh, used by ASPE to send secret information. And I would not trust him. Maybe he wants to, he wants to get the information without telling me. And uh, uh, then he comes to me and tells me what elaborate apparatus he's using, and I still don't believe it. And the basic point is that if, you, if he's able to show to me that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the, the, the quantum correlations which are used to establish a key uh, violated Bell inequality without any assumptions, without any loophole, then I don't even have to know what his apparatus is built of. Exactly. I'm safe. And that, that then I can use the apparatus without trusting. And that's the point. So I, the way I said in, in the talk, if you remember, I said that these are the final convincing proof of, uh, that, quantum, that quantum cryptography is safe. Uh, I would not even call it a proof, it's the final argument. I mean, everybody knows that quantum mechanics is correct and it works that way, but it's the final corner, the final little stone in the, in the building, I would say. Yeah. What I like to say is that the only instance in which this security could be uh, violated, or, or uh, yes, violated, is if the laws of quantum mechanics itself were wrong. Yes. It's a, it's a, you but agree. This is a strong statement, but uh, I mean, this is what we have nowadays. We, right. we have a way to say this is secure unless quantum and mechanics is not true. Wolfgang Pauli once said that the uh, laws of quantum mechanics probably will stay for us for a couple of hundred years. I do not know why he said a couple of hundred years, why he did not say forever, but that was his statement. I agree. Uriel Frisch. On this side. On this side. Yeah. Um, I, I shall ask uh, my question in German for an obvious Einsteinian reason. Uh, raffiniert or wolfshaft? Subtil or malicieux? You can answer in English, of course. Oh, this is a very good <laughs> question. Whether the Lord is subtle or raffiniert or, or boshaft? Raffiniert or boshaft? Uh, uh, I probably, probably he is both. <laughs> probably he is both. It, I have, you know, uh, that it is, you know, in a in a deeper sense. To answer your question in a deeper sense, uh, it is actually amazing now. Uh, if one looks at, uh, you know, Einstein did not like quantum entanglement. I mentioned that in my talk because of the spooky action kind of thing. Uh, but one could then, uh, uh, but Einstein worried about that this allows faster than speed of light communication. Now we know that faster than speed of light communication is not possible, and why? Because the individual measurement result is random. So, it, and ran, Einstein did also not like randomness. He said, God does not play dice with the universe. So it is amazing to see that a feature of quantum mechanics, which uh, Einstein did not like, namely randomness, protects entanglement, which he also did not like, from violating the uh, theory of relativity. Uh, in that case, God was very, very subtle, sehr raffiniert, 
and probably a little bit vicious to play it with Einstein, I don't know. There is a question on that side here. Yeah. Uh, I Can would, I? Uh, I, would, I would first uh, congratulate you for your work, beautiful work. Now, I have a question. What would happen if you set up on the path of one photon a device that could uh, change randomly the plane of polarization of this photon? How does the second photon would react since it's entangled? Uh, yes. Uh, this, this is an extremely deep question uh, in the following sense, namely that the two photons, as long as they are entangled, do not have a well-defined plane of, re of polarization. So what is, what, is, what is defined is the relative orientation of the polarization should they be measured. Then if you introduce a polarization rotator, then you don't change the polarization of the individual photon because that has a mixed state, as we say, but you change the correlations between the two. And that is a non-local phenomenon. Uh, Thierry Jean-Marc. Yes, you, you mentioned that somehow the, the three experiments that you talked about are a little bit like the last line of defense uh, for quantum or let's say, the last corner for quantum cryptography. Does it mean that the field is now moving in the realm of engineering? Or are there still kind of physics questions that need to be answered? And if yes, of course, uh, which one? Uh, there are. Uh, if you look uh, at the title of our paper, it is intentional that it says significant loophole free as hyphens. So we do not want to claim that we close everything. We, uh, we only want to say that we address three significant loopholes in the experiment. There are still open questions. Uh, one open question is, for example, every experiment assumes that the classical records of the two measurements cannot be changed afterwards. That's interesting. I mean, it's natural in physics, but it is an assumption. Uh, uh, and there are other smaller assumptions which are still open. Uh, I'm sure there will be further experiments along the line. But on the other hand, uh, the second question is, yes, uh, the field has to move into engineering. This is very important. Uh, quantum cryptography is known to be secure now. Uh, the limit is uh, data rate and distance. Uh, data rate is the limit is that uh, uh, the limits are about one megabit per second. That's very low for for the internet. It's nothing. Uh, the distance is of the order of 100 kilometers. To overcome the distance, we need quantum repeaters. I mentioned that briefly, or satellites. Uh, to uh, overcome the data rate, we need uh, much better sources and much better detectors. I personally believe that this is an engineering challenge and not a fundamental issue. I understand that this, it's interesting that even uh, that this is now, we are, we are now witnessing, actually this year and next year, that more and more uh, uh, companies step into the field. Google did, for example, shortly ago, uh, for quantum computation, which is the broader field. Uh, China is, is putting enormous in, amounts of money into the field. It's amazing. And now the European Commission is also discovering that they want to do something. And that will be interesting. It's an inter interesting situation which has not often happened, I think. Uh, there is a broad feeling that this will be very important in the future, but nobody really can pinpoint which technology will be the best. Like for quantum computers, we talk about atoms, ions, we talk about uh, photons, we talk about superconducting qubits, uh, we talk about uh, 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 color centers and diamond and so on. All of these are nicely proceeding, but nobody knows which one will be winning in the end. But everybody has the feeling that there will be something important, so we, in that situation, uh, one has to work on all of that. 
Ju just before uh, giving word to Edouard Brazard, could you tell us what, what is spooky meaning or in, in these sort of experiments? What, what, what is meant there? Spookhaft, spook. by spookhaft Einstein meant that it is like, uh, like uh, by spookhaft, uh, I think Einstein meant that, that it's like uh, you do something here and over there something instantly happens without any any information without any any communication, which I suppose should happen in some old castles or whatever. I don't know. So it's really a phantom or something. It's not very it is not very serious. It's just I yes, think. Yes, I would comment on that. <laughs> I would. Yeah, it, it's this sentence is written in the context of a reasoning ad absurdum. Yes. Einstein makes goes ad on absurdum. and makes again the EPR reasoning, and the EPR reasoning consists of saying. To explain this strong correlation, I need a local realistic view of the world, which is to say that each system carries along right. with this some information, which is correlated with the information on the other side, and that the only reasonable way. Because, says Einstein, and it is where the reasoning at absurdum say, if I were not right, then you would have to accept blah, 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 a spooky right. action at a distance. You would have to accept that in space-time, something happening here instantaneously affects there. Of course, he did not believe in it. And not believing in it, he, he could make his conclusion in his reasoning at absurdum. So clearly, at that time, he did not believe in it. But he did not know about the results of the violation of Bell's inequalities. So mm -hmm. nobody knows what he would have said after uh, knowing the violation of maybe equality. maybe we will learn it someday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you briefly explain how the two quasars will measure your untangled photons? What do they do, and how do you will we be aware of what they do? The idea is to use uh, to have to create an entangled pair here and send each photon away by about two or three kilometers. That is enough. And then uh, what you have to do, as I said in the last, uh, 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 which was that, that was already the communication loophole, uh, uh, which I mentioned, uh, you have to decide in the last instance, in the, independently on both sides, which polarization to measure. And that is where the quasars will come in. So we take, we take the quasar light from here. The idea is to measure with single photon detectors uh, the uh, fluctuations of the light coming in. And uh, we are still debating, but probably the temporal correlation between photons, subsequent photons detected, will be the source of randomness. And here and there, and provide independent last instant definition of what is being measured. And now since the two detectors look at, uh, the two uh, uh, telescopes look at two different regions of space, and they do this very fast, there could not have been any communication from that quasar to the other side in time, or from that quasar to this side in time. And uh, Well, polarization is another possibility. We are, we are debating the point, the difference between polarization and just counting arrival time is basically that polarization is a two-state system, arrival time is a one-state system. So there is some differences. Polarization has the advantage that it is very stable upon propagation through the atmosphere, for example. But that is not, not completely decided yet which of the two features uh, we will use in the experiment. All right, I think uh, that we, we had questions and uh, the day has been long for, uh, to all of us and we would like to thank you, uh, Anton, for this very beautiful lecture. Thank you. Very thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.